This is a review over all of chapter two. We're just gonna fly through each section, the main ideas in each point, so that if you have an upcoming test or an upcoming final, you'll have a really good review over what this chapter was about. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So for section 2.1 to 2.2, that's when you're talking about uh, rate of change. And we had two kinds. We had average and instantaneous. Average rate of change is what we're used to. That's if on a graph it looks like this, we have some function like that. Average rate of change is just the line between these two points that you're interested in. It's the secant line. The way we calculate average rate of change is we just use our slope formula. Same one we've been using. Difference in y's over difference in x's. And that'll give you the average rate of change between two points in a function. Okay, but the new thing that we learned in this section was instantaneous rate of change. What that looks like on a graph is you have this function, instantaneous rate of change is that tangent line at a specific point. Remember, tangent line only touches this function at exactly one point. The way we calculate instantaneous rate of change, well, we don't know how to calculate it directly yet, so we had to estimate it. And we estimated it by first making a table. So let's just say this is the point x equals 4. Our first step was we plugged in x values closer and closer to 4 from both sides. So maybe 3.9, 3.99 from the left, and coming closer to the right, maybe 4.01, 4.1, and so on. We plug these x values into our function, got our y output values. And our second step was we found the slope between these x values that we plugged in and the point that we're interested in. And by finding the slope between all these points, we're able to see a pattern and get a pretty good estimate of what the instantaneous slope is at this specific point. Okay, another topic we talked about in these uh, sections was limits. Remember, when they're asking for the limit of a function, they're just asking what y value is a function approaching as we get uh, closer and closer to this x value, to this point of interest. In this section, we learned how to estimate limits, and we did that really similarly to how we estimated slope. If they're asking for the limit as x approaches 4 of this function, they're interested in x equals 4, so we're going to plug in x values closer and closer to 4 from both sides again. Um, in this section, though, we don't have to do the second step from here. We just look at it. Step one was make a table. Step two was look at table. And we just see what y value is our function approaching as we get closer and closer to our point of interest from either side. And going off of that topic, three ways a limit does not exist is, first way is if the right-hand limit doesn't equal the left-hand limit. What that looks like on a graph is, from the left, your function is approaching some value. But from the right, it's approaching some different value. Since the left-hand side isn't the same as the right-hand side, the limit doesn't exist in this case. A second way a limit doesn't exist is if it's approaching infinity. And what that looks like is it's either going all the way up to positive infinity or it's going down to negative infinity. Either way, it's not approaching an actual value, so we say the limit does not exist. And the third way a limit doesn't exist is if the function is oscillating. What that means is if it's going up and down super, super quick. I'm gonna attempt to draw this. It looks something like that. An example of a function that oscillates is a function uh, sine of pi over x. Okay, section 2.1 to 2.2, we talked about rate of change. We learned how to estimate instantaneous rate of change, and we also learned how to estimate limits both of them by plugging in x values closer and closer to our point of interest. Um, when we're estimating rate of change, we then want to find the slope between all those points. When we're estimating the limit, we're only concerned about what the function is doing. So we're only concerned about these y values. So we just look at it. And don't forget the three ways a limit cannot exist. All right, moving on to 2.3 to 2.4. These sections were about continuity. And if you remember, our definition of continuity is if the limit as x approaches c of some function, f of x, is equal to f of c, then our function is continuous. Which makes sense, because if we were to draw this out, we have some value, c, here. And if the limit of our function, what the left and the right hand side are approaching, is the same as what this function is defined at, then it's continuous. All right, but three types of discontinuities. One way is if we have a jump discontinuity. 
And this is kind of similar to this uh, limit uh, that does not exist over here. So what a jump discontinuity looks like is your function is doing something over here, then all of a sudden it jumps up to some new value and continues on. In this case, like we were just saying, the limit does not exist here because right-hand limit doesn't equal left-hand limit. Second type of discontinuity, also similar to this type of limit that doesn't exist, is called an infinite discontinuity. And much as the name might suggest, that's whenever the function is approaching either positive infinity or negative infinity. Third way, or a third type of discontinuity is called a removable discontinuity. And what that looks like is it's just kind of like a hole in a graph. So you have a function, then all of a sudden it's not defined somewhere, and the function keeps going. The function could be defined at another point here, so there could be a dot drawn um, somewhere else, or there could be no dot. Either way, it's still a removable discontinuity. Now, key thing to note between removable and jump discontinuities, jump discontinuities, limit does not exist. Removable discontinuities, limit does exist. And that'll be, that'll be true for um, any type of removable and any type of jump discontinuity. All right, moving on to section 2.5 to 2.6. So this is where we learned how to solve limits directly. We are done with estimating them by plugging in points closer and closer. Hallelujah, because that took forever. No one liked it. And now we moved on to the more math way of how to do these things. So remember, if we're solving a limit algebraically, our first step is to always try direct substitution. We just plug in our point of interest into the function, see what happens. Two things could happen. One, we get a valid answer. Good news, you're done. But what is more likely to happen is you get something called an indeterminate form. Remember, there's three types, either zero over zero, infinity over infinity, or infinity minus infinity. If you get any of these values after you try direct substitution, that means indeterminate form, not valid answer. It means do more work. <laughs> the type of work that we need to do for these problems it's we're gonna try to simplify the function. We try to simplify it, get a term to cancel out, or get it to match some identity, so that when we try direct substitution again, we'll get a valid answer. All right, and from here, we're gonna go through three common types of functions that you'll see, and the first steps you should do on how to simplify them. So the first one we're going through is a function that has complex algebraic expressions. So we see here in the numerator, we have a quadratic, Remember, we can simplify quadratic by foiling it down into two binomials being multiplied by each other. This quadratic simplifies down into 2x plus 1 and x minus 5. And on the bottom here, we have a pattern called the difference of perfect squares. That's whenever we have a squared minus b squared, two perfect squares being subtracted. This always simplifies down into a plus b and a minus b. And notice we have an x minus 5 term that could cancel here. We could cross these out, try direct substitution again, and we'd get a valid answer. All right, next type of function that we see is one involving radicals. Whenever you see a radical, you want to think conjugate. Multiply both the top and the bottom by the conjugate. Remember, the conjugate is just whatever this radical term is with the sign in the middle flipped. So in this case, we multiply both the top and the bottom by the conjugate, which is radical x plus 4, and instead of a minus, I'm going to put plus 3. Whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top. So I multiply this entire fraction by this conjugate, hopefully something will cancel, and I'll be able to try direct substitution again and get a valid answer. All right, next type of function that we see a lot of times is one involving trig. So for trig, our first step for these type of, types of limits is we want to rewrite it in terms of just sine and cosine. So for example, here if I had tangent, I could rewrite tan 4x as sine 4x over cosine 4x. So I rewrite this function in terms of just sine and cosine, simplify it a little bit, and step two, I want to get it to match an identity. If you remember in section 2.6, there were two identities we learned, one for sine and one for cosine. Our sine identity told us that the limit as x approaches zero, of sine x over x, and remember, this doesn't have to be just x here, it could be sine something over that same something, 
is equal to 1. And for cosine, our limit was the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x, or cosine anything, over that same anything is equal to 0. Okay, so 2.5 to 2.6, we learned how to solve limits directly um, using algebra. We always try direct substitution first, but a lot of times we'll need to simplify the function either by factoring it, multiplying by the conjugate, or simplifying the trig and trying to get it to match an identity. So that after we do all these steps, we can try direct substitution again and hopefully get a valid answer. All right, moving on to 2.7. This was limits at infinity. And if you remember, there's a couple different ways we could approach these problems. Uh, right now I'm gonna go over the algebraic way of how to solve this limit. So if you have a limit as x approaches infinity, we're gonna look at our denominator and pick out the highest power and divide every term in both the denominator and the numerator by this leading power. In this case, our highest power is just x, so we divide everything by x. On the top here, we have an x cancel, so we're left with just 9x. Over, on the bottom, we have 6 over x minus, these x's cancel, minus 29. And from here, remember we have the limit as x approaches infinity. So if we have a number over x, either down here or in the numerator, we can just cross it out, it becomes zero. Because remember, if we have a super huge number in the de denominator, how many times does super huge number go into small number? Basically zero times. So now what I'm left with is just 9x over negative 29. If I were to plug in super huge number, like infinity, in for x, on the top, I'd get huge infinity divided by negative 29. This will give me negative infinity. Um, and remember, there's other ways you could solve these limit problems. You could memorize the rules and compare the um, numerator leading power to the denominator leading power, and just remember what those rules tell you. Or you could just think about it conceptually and think, well, if I were to plug in infinity up here where I have an x squared term, that's going to uh, have more power than down here in the denominator. And you could solve these limits that way also. And remember, for this section, we also learned how to find horizontal asymptotes. It's the same process. To find the horizontal asymptotes of a function, you just find the limit as x approaches infinity. All right, last section, intermediate value theorem. What intermediate value theorem told us and just real basic terms is, one, if we have a function that's continuous, that has to be the first point. Our function is continuous, so something like this. And we have some value down here, that's negative, some value up here, that's positive, and there must be some value here in the middle that is equal to this, f of c. And the types of problems we use this for was, one, if we're looking for a root of a function, we could say, well, I know my function is continuous, if it's going from some negative value to some positive value, then I know that somewhere in the middle, it has to have a root of the function, or it has to cross the x-axis. It could also use this in other terms if, let's just say you're interested in, if it passed this value, let's call this 5, if you knew that down here the function was negative 1, and up here the function was 10, then you know that somewhere in the middle it's going to pass through the value um, f of x equals 5. Okay, so that was a marathon right here. So hopefully this was a pretty good review over each section. Um, some basic study tips if you have a test coming up is, one, try to make just a one-page review over all the main topics in this chapter, kind of like what we did here. Um, and then, two, look through your homework problems, because that's going to be a really big place where your professors are going to pull questions from for their tests. And you won't have time to go through every problem. So just look through the problems and try to see if you can walk through the steps in your mind of how to solve them. If you're having trouble with some of them, then try to actually solve some out by hand and learn how to do them. All right, so I hope this was helpful. If you have more questions, remember that we have our tutoring center in the first floor of Sidrich. You can come by anytime we're open uh, for more clarification. I hope you found this video really helpful. The concepts covered in this video are true no matter what calculus class you're in, but all the sections and problems I referenced were from this textbook right here. And remember that if you're a registered Baylor student, we offer free tutoring on the first floor of Sid Rich. You can either schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment online or just drop in whenever you're available during our business hours for free tutoring. For more information, feel free to visit our website.